Hey everyone, this is Christian Heimel, host of Press Row. Thanks so much for listening to the following broadcast, courtesy of Public House Media. Hi, this is Emily. This is Lindsay. And this is Elizabeth. Co-hosts of Beauties and Headcanons here on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Once you are done with this episode, we hope you'll come check out our show, Beauties and Headcanons, where we talk nerdy to you about fandoms, fan fiction, and all pop culture for nerds that you can think of. A new show comes out every Friday. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you never miss an episode of Beauties and Headcanons. Thanks again for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. Welcome to the Confessions of a Military Spouse podcast. I am your host, Jenna Burt. I am a military spouse of almost 10 years, a health and fitness enthusiast, a dental assistant, and a mom to an amazing little girl. And I am so excited about today's episode. I have a very special guest with us. He is actually the sports director for Public House Media and has his own podcast, Press Row. And I am so excited to have him here with us. So, Chris, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you and your affiliation with the military and why I'm so excited to have you here. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm excited to, to be on the show, Jen. I mean, I, honestly, I was so excited when Baxter announced it, that this show was coming. Um, I, as you said, I am the sports director uh, here at Public House Media. I do host and produce Press Row every Thursday, but then also I'm the producer of The Cheap Seats, which is a three-day-a-week show. We're going to be uh, going through some format changes here after the Super Bowl, but I'm a big sports guy. Uh, but my association with the military is uh, I may not be a military spouse, but I am a military brat and a military sibling. Um, my father uh, recently retired in 2017 after 30 years in the Army. Um, my And he actually now is the um, the director of the District of Columbia Veterans Affairs Hospital. So he's still involved in the military. Um, my Both my younger brothers are active duty, Uh, one who is stationed uh, both in the Army. One is stationed in Alaska. The other one is stationed at Fort Riley in Kansas. And then to go even further with that, my mother is a military brat. Um, Her father was um, in the Vietnam War. I've had uh, countless relatives who have been in the military, countless friends who are in the military. Um, it, It has been probably one of my true passions is supporting military members and their families more than anything else. It's, it's uh, been a, a lot of fun in terms of a lot of the things that I do and choose to to work with in my life or, or how they benefit military members and more importantly, their families, because um, a lot of people see the uniform, but they don't see people like you, Jenna, uh, the ones who stand behind it and support it the entire time. Yes. And that is one of the things that I'm so excited about. I'm excited about the fact that you're not a spouse, (laughs) which sounds really (laughs) funny uh, because that's the name of my podcast. But there's more to it than just spouses. Like you said, there's family members that are behind it. There's parents that are behind it. There's siblings that are behind it. And the other aspect that I'm really excited about is the fact that you are a male. And I know that sounds super funny, but I feel like a lot of times when people think of military families, they think of females, they think of wives, they think of, you know, female children. And Mm -hmm. there is another aspect there. There is a male behind it, whether it's a sibling, a parent, or even a spouse. There are male spouses out there. Yep. But I feel like a lot of times it's forgotten. So I'm super excited to have you here to share this side of being in the military or affiliated with the military. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're 100% correct. I mean, it's, it's been a part of, um, it, it really has been a part of my life uh, for, you know, 30 years. It's, it's what I, it's the only thing that I've known is being a military family member. Um, so, you know, and there are other aspects of it, you know, it's not just the one who puts on the, but it, it's something special to, you know, there's a little bit of a difference. I, I feel, you know, for instance, both my brother's um, are, are married and the, the women that they, um, that they are married to similar to you, that they had to make a very conscious decision that, okay, I'm choosing the military lifestyle. I'm choosing to be a part of this. I didn't get that choice. I was, I was born into that lifestyle. I didn't get the choice of, you know, 
hey, I don't want to be moving every two years and, and you know, not having a true hometown and uh, potentially not having a true set of friends as, as you grow up. But um, it, it is a little bit different. But it, it, at the same time, you know, it, it's all for one mission. And that is, you know, to support uh, and, and love everybody who who is, aff- is affiliated with the uniform, no matter which branch you are. Yes. And you bring up such a great point And it gives us something to dive right into is you didn't have a choice in this lifestyle. And as a military spouse myself and a mom, that's something that I really struggle with uh, when it comes to my daughter is that she didn't have a choice in this Mm -hmm. lifestyle. She probably doesn't want to move every two to three years. So with that being said, how do you feel like it has affected you and, and your life and the path that you took in your life not having this choice and being basically thrown into this. You know, it, it, it's kind of a, a sink or swim mentality more than anything else. I mean, there's, there's a big, I think, social construct in terms of, um, you know, the, the introverts or the extroverts. I am most certainly an extrovert and it is because of the military lifestyle that I am that, uh, my parents will tell stories of, you know, from when we were stationed at Fort Gordon in Georgia or Fort Sam Houston in Texas or Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, where I will just randomly walk up to people at two and three years old and introduce myself because I didn't have people to play with. So I just introduced myself and wanted to go hang out. You know, dad, my my father was very young in his career when I was a child. So, um, you know, this is nothing. My father is a tremendous human being and my greatest role model. But Um, you know, he really wasn't around a lot when I was a kid because he was working so much to build his career. And so therefore I had to find other ways to, to get that attention, so to speak. And my mother was, uh, at, you know, I was two and a half and my brother was born. So my mom had another baby to focus on as opposed to, to me as the oldest. So it definitely changed things a little bit, but that made me very much an extrovert. And I think a lot of it, um, came from the, the support of my parents. Uh, you know, the the ones who said, you know, in today's society, you may not, you know, you probably don't let your kids go out and play, um, you know, till, you know, dusk till the sun starts (laughs) setting. You probably don't, you're probably not okay with your kid walking up to a random stranger in the, in the grocery store and saying hi and introducing themselves. Um, but you know, my parents were comfortable with it. Um, now granted, a lot of it is because we were living on military bases and it's a different social construct there too, because everybody feels you, you do feel a greater sense of security when you're living on a military base than as if you were just at your local grocery store when you're not living on post. Um, so that definitely had a a little bit of it, but at the same time, you know, maybe subconsciously as we moved around a lot when I was a kid, I probably realize in some way, shape or form, the only way I'm going to make friends is if I go out and make friends, you know, because I could either sit here for two years and be quiet and then move on, or I can make friends. And, and you know, I was lucky enough to, to become the kind of person who just is very outgoing and very extroverted. It's probably what led to me having a career in broadcasting and being <laughs> on radio uh, is, is because, you know, I, I, I like to talk a lot and um, I'm, I'm not afraid to talk. So, uh, you know, it, it definitely shaped who I was, I think a lot because of, you know, how much we did move. And it it was that uh, maybe subconscious choice as a kid to say, you know, I'm I'm not going to sit at home and be by myself. I'm going to go out. I'm going to make friends. Um, And again, I think a lot of it was because of how military bases are run. They do a lot of things for those families to not only interact the children, but interact the parents as well. Because I mean, and, and Jenna, you know this, when, when, when your loved one is deployed, you need that support system. You can't just stay in your house and, and focus on, on just you. You'll go crazy. Um, and military bases do a tremendous job with those community events to try to find ways to get people involved um, and find ways to ensure that the spouse, the child, um, the brother, the sister – is, is being at least, you know, they know that they, that, that it's okay to, for your loved one to not be around, to not see them, to not talk to them for a long period of time. So I definitely think, um, you know, it, it, it certainly did shape me in, in, in a, in a number of different ways. You made some amazing points there. I, I love the fact that you said, you know, it, it almost drove you to become an extrovert. And I'm mm-hmm. very much extroverted myself. My husband is very much introverted and I pray mm-hmm. to God that my child gets my <laughs> extrovertedness because like you said, 
when you're moving every two to three years, you don't really have a choice. Well, you have a choice. Mm -hmm. It's either sit at home and be miserable, don't make friends, you know, keep to yourself or go out there and make friends and put yourself out there, even though you know in two or three years you're going to have to move. Which... Yeah, and, and and it's it's interesting, but it's interesting you said because it, it's almost kind of generational. Like my younger brother, the middle one of the family, he was very much an introvert. He really was. He was a very shy kid, um, but he, you know, some it, it's it's going through basic training probably changed that form and 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 forced him to find his voice a little bit. My mother, though, who has been a military brat and a military spouse and now a military mom. Um, she's still very much introverted. Um, it was, so, so it is kind of a conscious choice that, you know, your, your child will eventually have to make it at some point is, Hey, and, and, and sometimes it does work out really well because you know what you, your, your friend may not be uh, a military brat or a military child, but they're, they may be, you know, their uncle may be there, their cousin may be there. You know, there may be some sort of lineage that you can at least start a conversation with and eventually develop a friendship. Some of my best friends, honestly, I've known for 20 years um, because we kept in touch because of granted help with the technology and all that stuff. But because, you know, because we were able to have that, um, you know, that, that, that social construct where we basically mentally forced ourselves to, to get to know other people. Yeah. And I think it's important to note that you just said, you know, you've been a military affiliated with the military for a really long time and you have friends that you have had for a really long time because Mm -hmm. of your military affiliation you made these friends and you guys made the choice to nurture the relationship and to keep your friendship strong because i feel like a lot of times people have the misconception of well your military family you're only going to be here for a couple years there's no way you can make lasting friendships and that's that's Mm -hmm. not the case that's not the case at all No, most definitely. It's not. I mean, and, you know, I I was a little bit different because at one point, you know, one of my mother's biggest dreams was to be a homeowner. And you don't get to do that when you're living on base and getting VA housing (laughs) and all that stuff. You know, that was you don't you don't get to do that. So my father at one point uh, is actually really, really funny. We got stationed at Fort Meade, Maryland, and we rented a house um, off base. Then my dad bought a house uh, for my mom so that she could be a homeowner. And maybe a month later, after after we closed on the house, my dad was got transitioned and sent to, to Walter Reed uh, in, in, in D.C. Now, granted, fortunately, it was only an hour and a half away, but my dad had to start making that – or 45 minutes away, but my dad had to start making that commute um, so that my mom could be a homeowner. So we lived off base for a very long time, and not many military, not many military families live off base. So the kids that I was you know in the neighborhood with, they knew about the military because it was right there. But they didn't necessarily know what it was like to be a part of it. And it's still it kind of changes different things a little bit. It kind of, you know, changes your your conversations with those people. It kind of changes how you react. I mean, I was in seventh grade going to a school that was not on a military base when 9-11 happened. And oh I I became essentially the focus of all my classmates because they knew my father was in the military. Um you know, and when you live 40 minutes from from the Pentagon on 9/11, it, it kind of changes some things for you. It makes things real. You know, makes people, especially when you're not living on a military base, it, you kind of become the focus of everybody else. It's very strange, but also at the same time, kind of adds to that stuff a little bit. So, like you said, I think it's really important to know that not everybody. You don't have to live on base or on post whenever you're a military family. It's not required. You can choose to live off base. I feel like now it's it's a little more common um, mm-hmm. to live off base than it is on. And now they have like on base, off base housing, which is really weird. But yep. <laughs> <laughs> if you're living in a community where not everybody is military, it is really common for you to kind of become the center of attention because they're intrigued by your lifestyle and they're curious about you know how you guys live but I also feel like the support is is different you know when you guys were living off base did you have that feeling too of they support you but it's a it's a different type of support yeah you know it's it's strange on base it's almost kind of a it's an unspoken support like everybody knows everybody knows who's deployed Yes. Everybody knows which dad isn't there, which mom <laughs> isn't around. Um, and so it's just kind of, it's, it's not an, it's, it's not like, oh, hey, how are things going? It's, 
hey, why don't you and, and Tommy come on over for a barbecue today kind of thing. Like that's that's the kind of support. It's just trying to get you out of the house to do stuff. Meanwhile, when you live off base and, you know, it's, hey, um, haven't seen your dad in a while. Oh, yeah, well, that's because he's, he's deployed. He's going to be gone for, for another five months. Uh, and then they go, oh, how are you doing? And then all, all of a sudden they start coming over and they're literally asking. They're not trying to see how you're doing. They're literally asking you how you're doing. So – um, it, it does change a little bit. It's a little bit more vocal support when you're outside um, of that military community. But at the same time, it, it's it's still support. And I, and I think that's one of the really important things that um, I've noticed from a lot of people and, and learned is that, you know, just because you may not agree with what's going on in certain you know political times or whatever it is, is that the people who wear the uniform and the people who love those who wear the uniform, they still respect the sacrifice that you're giving. And, and no matter where it's just shown in different ways, that's kind of the important part there. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree 100%. Um, like I said, you get the support from both places, but as you said, it's very different. People off base are, very curious and they're asking you how you're doing and they're not, you know, right. just saying, Hey, why don't you come over? Because they know you're not doing very good. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and then again, it's just trying to find ways, you know, um, they're almost fish. The people off base are almost kind of fishing for ways to make your life a little bit easier. Yeah. You know, so as, and, and then, you know, so like for instance, if, if it's 4th of July, it's, Hey, why don't we come over and help you, you know, cook or help, you know, whatever it is. Or if it's, you know, oh, yeah, they know that, you know, Sarah's got uh, soccer practice or something like that, and they offer to take, you know, your child or something like that. Th- those kind of things. All of a sudden, you, you find you can find babysitters really easily. <laughs> yes. When, when, <laughs> because they know that you, you know, you, you need that that help a little bit better. So it's, um, you know, it, it's nice. But at the same time, it's kind of one of those like, like, this is weird. And I, and I don't want to make it, you know, too, you know, oddly strange or, or perfect, but like I'm, I'm, I'm a cancer survivor. And when I was going through my chemo, people constantly kept asking how I was doing, which was fine. I knew it cause I was putting it out there that I, what I was going through. But then when I stopped and I, you know, was in remission, people kind of stopped asking how you were yeah. doing. It's like, you know, we're still fighting this thing. I'm just not as vocal about it because it's not as severe a fight. So it's kind of, a, it's similar in that sense. When, when your loved one is deployed, they're always asking you how you're doing because they know about it. They can see it. And then when you're when they're home, it's kind of like they don't you know, it's, it's not that they don't care. It's that that the interest level or the support maybe changes from a, you know, how are you doing to a oh, hey, you know, how's every how's everything going kind of thing. Oh, my gosh. Like my mind is blown right now. I've never really <laughs> thought about it in that aspect. But it's so true. It is so, so true. Because like you said, when your spouse or any family member is deployed, you know, like you said, people are constantly asking, how are you doing? They're coming to check, mm-hmm. check in on you to make sure that you're okay. But once they come back, it is a generalized, hey, how's everybody doing? Yep. Or, and, you know, and especially for the first, you know, couple of weeks, maybe even for the first couple of months, they almost kind of tread lightly yeah. when the person's come home because they don't want to, to touch a nerve. They don't, you know, and, and, and that's another part that, you know, some, some, Soldiers are really comfortable talking about what they did. Um, some really don't even want to think about it again. Um, you know, which which brings up a completely different aspect. <laughs> yeah. But you know, it, it's but everybody kind of does the same thing where they kind of tread lightly because they don't want to ask. Like I'll give you a prime example. My grandfather will not talk about when he was deployed. Won't do it. My little brother, on the other hand, who's already done one tour in Afghanistan, he's like, I'll, whatever you want to know, I don't care. Doesn't bother me. I'll tell you. Same with my father, who who was deployed. Um, a few, you know, almost a decade ago, a little over a decade ago. So it's, it's, uh, you know, it's one of those things. It's just, it's kind of interesting to see how people react. It is. It's very interesting. And I, so I want to go back to your treatment, your cancer treatment. Mm-hmm. First of all, it's amazing that you're in remission. Um, but a lot of times people talk about the military, um, insurance and health care mm-hmm. yep. <laughs> and it yep. doesn't have a good it doesn't have a nice sunny cloud around it let's be no. honest it's got a very dark black cloud that follows yep. it so i i want to i mean i know what my experiences have been like but i want mm-hmm. if you don't mind i want to talk about your no. experiences because i mean obviously you were in the healthcare 
yes. system and really, really dealing with it firsthand. And I want, I mm-hmm. want to know what your experience was like. Well, I'll be a hundred percent. And I've, I've said this to a lot of people and let me just say this right now, what I'm about to say in no way, shape or form um, is indicative of my political leanings. So I don't want anybody, you know, coming at me or coming <laughs> at you for, for, for political ideations or anything like that. But the Affordable Care Act saved my life. Um, I would not be talking to you if, if that had not been passed. Um, military health care can be kind of a, a pain in the neck. Um, you know, I uh, went through it a lot when I was a kid because I was the one who liked to, to see how many bones I could break. Um, <laughs> you know, just <laughs> I was I was one of those reckless boys, um, you know, and I was constantly in the ER, uh, you know, getting x-rays and stuff like that. Um, but when I went to, you know, so it's interesting you know, on your parents' health plan. Um, and then in the military, you know, you go to college um, and you have to be a full-time student to stay on your parents' health care. Um, it was very similar for, for a lot of people who, who weren't in the military. The difference was in the military, um, you had, at least that's how this is how it used to be four or five years ago when I was diagnosed. Um, it used to be that, um, you know, you could stay on until you were 25, as long as you were a, a full-time student, um, in, in the military and to stay on my, on my father's healthcare plan. And I was fortunate enough to do that. But when the affordable care act got passed and it upped the age to 26, that was where it became life-saving for me because I was diagnosed at age 25. I'd already aged out of the prior, uh, legislation um, when I was diagnosed, but because of the affordable care act, I was able to, um, to still receive treatment, um, and to be able to do all the scans that were needed and and to get all the chemotherapy that I needed because of that. And, you know, so there's a lot of red tape. Yes. No health plan is perfect by any stretch of it. What we have is, is most certainly not perfect. It's not even halfway there. Um, but you know, from a military standpoint, um, having my father's insurance and being able to be a part of that was huge because I was able to even, you know, I was, my, my cancer was found by going to a military hospital, by going to West Point in New York, where I was living at the time and going to their doctors, um, because that's what I could afford because that's the plan that I was on was my father's military plan. And then when I turned 25, it would have changed, but the affordable health care act allowed me to continue. I didn't have my treatment at West point. I had my treatment elsewhere in New York city. Um, but I was still covered by my father's health care because of the affordable care act. So, I mean, it does make things a little different. What, what I have noticed and what I will say is that, um, I think where the military health care really needs to adjust and change, um, is for, the retirees for the honorably discharged, yes. um, because those are the ones who are dealing with a hell of a lot more than what we currently are. I mean, it's one thing, yes, if your child is sick or breaks a bone, or if, you know, for, for you, you know, for, for mothers, for maternity care and stuff like that. Um, but at the same time, you know, for my grandfather, who's been retired for I don't know, 30, 40 years, the fact that he still has trouble getting his medical attention that he needs. And, and he, you know, served his country overseas multiple times. Um, those are the issues that I think really need to be focused on more than anything else. Yeah, I agree completely. Um, I, I swear like every week I open up Facebook and I see another veteran that has taken their life because they're not getting mm-hmm. the care that they need after retiring from the military. And I mean, let's be honest, most of the time, the issues that these people are dealing with are issues that have happened in the military, but they're not yes. able to get the proper care that they need. And so they feel like the only way out is to take their life. And yeah. it's sad. It is and so sad. It, it, it really isn't. And, and I'm going to equate it again I'm, as a big sports guy. I'm going to equate it to, to football, to the NFL. The NFL is in a terrible job with its retired players who are suffering from CTE, which is a direct cause of the concussions that they suffered playing football. Uh, the NFL is what caused these these traumatic brain injuries is what has caused CTE, and yet the NFL has done a terrible job of helping those who have this disease because of the sport they played. The military has really struggled and, and in my opinion, must get better to help their employees, for lack of a better term, their employees combat and deal with and survive these diseases that they 
got because they were employed by the military. So, you know, I mean, and it, but at the same time, you know, Jenna, it it goes back to that support system. It goes back to that, that, that community that, you know, some of these people, and this is the other part that it's very weird. You know, I have a lot of, uh, I have a lot of, of male friends who were former soldiers who did their four years, their eight years, whatever they did and they're done and they're civilians now and they talk, you know, they're my age, but they talk about, you know, oh, you know, we've we've changed as a society. We're much more wimpy now. Well, you know what? <laughs> you know, I, I don't care how wimpy, you know, you may be. If you've got a thought in your head that you may hurt yourself or somebody you love, being wimpy is is not telling someone that and not helping yourself by trying to get the help. Being wimpy is holding that in. Um, and that's why, you know, someone like I look at, you know. He, he's, he's the most well-known, one of the most well-known ones. So I'll, I'll, I'll bring him up, but I look at Chris Kyle and what yeah. he did when he came home, he had all of these thoughts in his head. He had these demons and instead of, you know, being secluded, becoming a drunk, becoming, you know, maybe an abusive father or an abusive mm-hmm. husband, he found a way and he found a community to help himself and to help others. It's unfortunate that someone he was trying to help is the reason he's no longer here, but What's, in my opinion, what's more commendable than him constantly wanting to go back and serve his country was how he wanted to continue to help the guys who couldn't serve anymore, the amputees, the ones who had those thoughts in their head. That, to me, is is much more heroic and much more admirable as a military member than, you know, just putting on that uniform. It's helping those who put on the uniform. Exactly. And like we just talked about, there's the support system. Mm-hmm. When military members are in and f- and for their families, I feel like is abundant. I feel like it's there. It's great, but mm-hmm. it's what happens afterwards that people don't realize. And it's things yep. like this. They have these thoughts. I mean, honestly, I feel like as a spouse, I worry about when my husband retires. I don't necessarily worry about him so much, but I kind of worry about myself because this will have been what I've known for the last like 15 years or so. I mean, and yeah. that's like, that's kind of a hard thing to deal with. So I think about myself in that aspect. And then I think about him. And like you said, in the military, they're pretty much trained. Like you don't talk about stuff. If you have these thoughts, mm-hmm. like keep them to yourself. You're a wimp if you have these thoughts. And so people don't talk about them. And that's where the problem comes in because the support that they need after the military isn't there. You're right. And, and again, I mean, it, it's not just, you know, um, my, my brothers, again, are both active duty and, and they're both, um, you know, well on their way to a, to a very strong career in the army. Um, but they tell me stories about, you know, and my father has had stories about soldiers that have been under his command who, you know, they didn't get the best leadership, you know, and, and, and there's a difference between, you know, you know, your your dad's military and today's military. You know, uh, there does have to be a little bit more compassion. I'm not saying everybody needs to hold hands and sing Kumbaya and everybody, gets, <laughs> you know, everybody gets a hug instead of a rifle uh, at basic training. But there needs to be some sort of change from trying to turn soldiers into emotionless tools of war and turning them into tremendous human beings that, if necessary, and when called upon, can be used to protect their country. There's a, there's a difference in that, and I think that's what a lot of people who join the military um, don't understand. If they don't, if they if they've never been in a military lifestyle, and they decide they're going to enlist, they're usually doing it as a last resort because they won't get into college or they don't think they're going to have a, a great job. And say, oh, I'll just go into the military. Well. Not everybody's cut out for it. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll be 100% honest. I don't think my, my younger brother, the middle one, the one who enlisted and went to basic training and doesn't have a college degree, I didn't think he was cut out for the military. And he's been in for uh, eight years now. And I couldn't be more proud of him um, for what he did because the military has helped shape him. Yeah. Um, and there's a difference in terms of, you know, those those type of people. And the problem is, is a lot of the young kids that you hear about, there was just a story – Um, you know, out of El Paso, Texas, that two, two soldiers were unfortunately killed, uh, in in an accident. Um, you know, but there have been more, uh, I think you, you know, I can't remember, I think it's 22 veterans a day, uh, take their lives. Um, and a lot of them are young kids. A lot of them are kids who realistically should be a year or two out of college when they do it. Um, 
And it's because they're not getting the leadership. They're not getting the support that they need because these are young kids, 20, 21, 22 years old. Maybe they don't have a significant other. They're hundreds of miles away from their family. They're being put in incredibly high stress situations because they don't have the education that allows them to be an officer. They're just enlisted and they're only told they're only taught how to shoot instead of you know how to do something else. And they don't see a purpose. And because they don't have that leadership, that's what's what's hurting them. So, you know, I mean, it, it is it's it's very disturbing to see it, but it, it's something that can and should be um, you know, easily preventable more than anything else. Absolutely. And I think it's really important that it's that it's talked about because that's part of it. These these military members, they go in, like you said, they're young and they're not taught compassion. They're not taught how to mm-hmm. deal with their feelings. And then they have these leaders that aren't much older than them and they're taught mm-hmm. the same things and it just gets continually passed along. And where does it stop? Right. You know, no, not- it, it, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, there has to be some sort of way to, to change it. I mean, and, and when you look at it, you know, I think the military, the, the civilian world, can learn a lot from the military in terms of structure, in terms yes. of, <laughs> in, ter- <laughs> in terms of structure, in terms of, um, you know, maybe not full discipline, um, but you know, it, some some aspects of discipline in terms of working together as a team and understanding that it's not about the soldier, it's about the unit. Um, and but at the same time, there is a lot. There's I think there's much more that the military world can learn from the civilian world, and that uh, and a lot of it comes from the fact of how do you handle certain, you know, mental aspects of your life? How do you handle, um, you know, certain interpersonal relationships within your life? Um, you know, you're, you're literally, I mean, it, I, I really do. I don't really think that some people aren't cut out for college and some people don't want to do it. That's fine. I understand that. But college, when you look at it, teaches you something similar from a interpersonal relationship the same way the military would. Yeah. The difference is it's a lot safer in college because you're learning other skills. You're learning how to progress your future. Meanwhile, in the military, how do you progress your future? Well, I'm the best shooter and I'm also <laughs> the one who, I'm also the one who can sometimes step up and actually talk to people and people respect me. Yeah. Um, how and does that's... that further you after a life of military? And I think that's one of the biggest things that the military need something from the civilian world is not just how do we make you the best right now, but how do we make you the best going forward? Exactly. And it's, it's not funny, but it's so true. It is Mm -hmm. absolutely true. They don't, you do your time and then you're done. They don't teach you life skills afterwards. Yep. Yeah. No, I mean, it'd be great if, you know, if, if the military taught us how to balance a checkbook, I'd sign up, but (laughs) right. Or taught us how to do our taxes. How about that? Exactly. Cause I didn't, I didn't learn how to do that either. uh, I didn't either. You know, (laughs) <laughs> I did, I you know, I, I, I do feel like I learned how to interact with, with people of different backgrounds when I was in college and, and in the military, it's, it's all, it's not about teaching you how to interact with them. It's teaching you how to follow orders with them and yes. how to, you know, but at the same time, and, and I can't speak for this cause I never put on the uniform. I came close, but I never did. I, you've got to trust, you know, there's the term battle buddies. You've got to trust that person that you're going to be sit. You could potentially be laying there in a foxhole next to you got to be able to trust them, respect them, care for them and understand and know full well that if you put your life in their hands, they're going to do what's in your best interest and vice versa. So there are different aspects of it that, that the two worlds can certainly teach. But at the same time, I, you know, there's, there's, we haven't been doing that. (laughs) Um, you know, I mean, it's, and there's, you know, I do have these conversations with my brothers about certain things and they're like, well, you know, you should do it this way. I go, listen, I'm not doing it that like I'm doing it this way. And and the next thing I, I'm doing it this way, because guess what? They're not going to get an article 15 if I do it. So, <laughs> exactly. you know, if I do it, if I do it this way in the civilian world, they're not going to get an article 15. It's not going to ruin their career. Um, it's not going to make them feel embarrassed and it might actually improve them as opposed to, you know, just as, as you would give them an article 15. And the next thing you know, they're really pissed off at you. They're pissed off at everybody else. They're upset because all their buddies get to go on deployment and they don't, they got to get stuck, stay home on, on a rear detachment. 
And then, you know, everything just spirals out of control. So I think there's a lot that we can both, you know, both worlds can still teach each other. Absolutely. And going back to, you know, this kind of ties into the whole getting out of the military and what happens with life after the military. How old were you when your dad retired? Uh, I was 28. So like I said, it was only about a year and a half ago. Oh, wow. uh, summer, Summer of 2017. So how has he adjusted to life after the military? <laughs> it's it's actually kind of funny. Um, so he retired. My dad my dad's last uh, my dad's last uh, state duty station. He was the commander of Walter Reed Military Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, he did that for for about two and a half three years. Um, retired. Um, he was a healthcare administrator. That was what his entire most of his career was in the military, um, and he ended up. Uh, going to work for Optum, which was the parent company of United Health Healthcare, uh, and working with their military affairs and and their um, you know their that division and and trying to help that made a lot of money. And when I say a lot of money, I don't mean like you know like a lot of you know civilian world money. I mean like a lot of like CEO type money. Like my my father was doing very well for himself, um, but you know, it's, it's really interesting when you look at my father, the military is not for him. It wasn't just a call to service for his contract. It was a call to service for lifetime. Um, my father left a very good paying job in the private sector, doing something that he could have easily done for the next 15, 20 years and retired. Um, but, uh, instead what he did was he wanted to go back and help, um, and, and help military members and help the veterans and their families. And like I said, he's now, um, you know, the chief, uh, he's running the, the district of Columbia veterans affairs, one of the worst VA hospitals in the country, um, to try to make things better for the soldiers who are there because they may not be wearing the uniform anymore, but they, they most certainly are soldiers for life. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and helping them and their families still get the medical treatment that they deserve and that they've earned by putting on that uniform. And that's amazing. That is so amazing. Because, <laughs> like you said, it's one of the worst VAs out mm-hmm. there. And it's so, it's just, it's so sad to me that we even have bad VAs because these people yeah. spend their life dedicated to our country and then they get out. They have to figure out what to do in the civilian world, which... right. After taking orders from somebody for 20 plus years, that's a huge mm-hmm. adjustment. And then on right. top of that, they have all these issues and things that they're dealing with and they get crappy health care. Yeah. No, and it's it's one of the most amazing things to me about, um, you know, you can have, in my opinion, you know, Walter Reed is tremendous. Well, I, I when I was going through high school and my dad was uh, was stationed there. I got some great treatment at Walter Reed. I got great treatment at Keller Army Hospital at West Point, New York. Um, I never had to have treatment, but my father worked for uh, Blanchfield at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Um, And they are notoriously known as one of the – they have one of the biggest and one of the most active maternity wards across across the military because (laughs) Fort Campbell – the 101st is the ones that gets deployed a lot. So every um, (laughs) – so there are a lot of – you know, you you can basically count your busy months based off the deployment schedule. That's hilarious. It's so true. (laughs) (laughs) um, But, you know, it's it's amazing that all of these things can be so great when they're active duty. But they almost become forgotten when they're retired um, or when they're discharged. And they either do one of two things. They, if they've earned their benefits um, you know, through their, their length of service, they are either you know, sent to VAs or they don't live – because they're sent to VAs because they don't live near a, an actual base. You know, that's, and that's one of the issues. Or they fall into the public system, which as we know, is, it's, it's not broken. It's shattered. Um, so there, there have to be other ways, um, to, to maintain and to fix it. It it astounds me that the most, the most important people, and this is, this is part of a capitalist society, which again, uh, I'm not, you know, trying to make a political statement (laughs) or anything, but I, I, cause I think capitalism can work and, and, and certainly, um, has, has proven that in the past, but the most important people to the future 
uh, of a society, your educators, your first responders, your military members, your police officers, firefighters, um, and all that are the ones who are the least taken care of. Um, you know, which is, is something to me that is, is incredible. I mean, yes, you've got your pension, you've got your benefits. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong my father has his benefits and, and all that stuff, but um, it's one thing to have it. It's another thing to be able to use it the right way. And there are certain areas where you're, you're unable to use those benefits the right way. If you're, if you're a retired military member who's earned his, who's put his 20 years in and has his full pension and has his full benefits. Um, you know, so it's, it, it is disturbing. It is scary to see that, but you know, it, it's good to know that there are people, you know, like my father who are doing what they can to, to make it that much better. Yeah. Absolutely. And we, we need more people like him in the world, plain and simple. <laughs> I, I, I don't disagree on that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so going back to retiring, because I mentioned yeah. about myself being, you know, concerned when my husband retires, how has your mom dealt with the retirement and the civilian life for your dad? You know, it's, it's, it's strange. Um, you know, they, they enjoy their life. They really do. They, um, you know, they bought a nice house outside of uh, DC in Maryland. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, they, they, they got a nice house, there, big backyard. Uh, they've got, you know, uh, a dog that keeps my mom company during the day. But, um, you know, again, m- my mom is, is very much an introvert still, um, which isn't a bad thing. You know, I mean, my, my girlfriend's an introvert and she's, she's phenomenal. Uh, she's incredible. Um, but you know, it, it's one of those things where I, I think, um, you know, she's, she was, I think she was a little disappointed, um, at how much he was still gone. Um, you know, how much he was still out of the house. He was still traveling for his work prior to joining the VA. Um, but you know, now, um, you know, because he has been doing it, she's almost used to it. You know, I, I don't think, yeah. I don't, you're, you're preconditioned, I mm-hmm. guess, you know, so it's, it's definitely a little strange. You know, you think, oh, he's retired. He's going to have more time at home. Yeah. And then, you know, yes, you're retired, but you're retired from the military. You know, you're, you're not retired from working, so to speak. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things that I think she still struggles with a little bit, but I also know that, you know, they, they did a very good job in, in terms of their finances and in terms of where they can do things together when they want, like they do take trips together. Um, they do have a little bit more of that time, which is great for them. And I know they enjoy that. Um, you know, I mean, they, I'm trying to remember where they, they most recently were. Like they don't go to extravagant travel. You know, it's not like they're going to, to, to Punta Cana every week or, or, you know, to Belize, but you know, they do get to go see family every now and again. They were, they, they visited me and my girlfriend in North Carolina for Thanksgiving because they can, yeah. um, you know, they, they got to go to, um, to New Jersey and see my dad's family. They got to go to, you know, they'll get to go to New Hampshire and see her family. They'll get to, do all these things and, um, you know, things that they couldn't really do when, when my dad was in the military, because I mean, yeah, you've got paid leave, but you know, you also get paid for that if you don't take it. So exactly. it almost behooves you, it almost behooves you to, to work and to not go on vacation, exactly. um, you know, what, while, while you're active duty. So it, they, they definitely do enjoy the fact. I think my mom definitely does enjoy the fact that they can, they can do more things together. Of course, some of that helps with the kids all being out of the house, but, um, and having it, having it just be them. But, you know, I, I definitely do think they enjoy having, having that time now on the weekends, you know, uh, uh, you know, and to be able to, to take a, uh, a holiday every now and again. Yeah. And you make, you make some great points because I feel like as spouses, we think, okay, our husband's going to retire. And then all of a sudden they're going to go back to this like <laughs> normal job and we're going to have all this time together and you know, all these things. But a lot of times it's not actually what happens because like you said, they retire from the military, but they don't retire right. from work. I mean, I guess if financially you had set yourself up that way, they could retire from work, but yeah. I think about it, the fact that my husband can retire before he's 40 and yep. <laughs> he's not going to want to sit at home for the next 40 years, you know, right. doing nothing. <laughs> so I know he's going to go back to work, but mm-hmm. it does open the door to take trips and to yes. spend more time together and do things together. And it's funny, I joke with my husband all the time, but I said, you know, when you retire, like, that's probably when we're going to have our fights and like, want to kill each other. And like, <laughs> I said, because we're actually going to spend time together. And 
it'll be amazing, but at the same time, it'll be something <laughs> so different that we've never experienced before. Yeah, no, you're 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 very right in that sense. I mean, you know, it's it's weird for me to know that like I don't have to give my dad four or five months <laughs> advance notice of things. You know, like I knew he would be at my college graduation because we knew what that was a year ahead of time. Yes. You know, um, we knew that, you know, he wasn't, you know, but at the same time, um, you know, my little brother, um, my, my, my younger brother, he and his wife have been officially married for over two years. They had to postpone their wedding. They just had their actual wedding ceremony this past September because of the army, uh, because they got PCS and he was deployed. Like it was, <laughs> it was that that's how things work. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, I mean, I think it's, I think it's also really important when, when you talk about the retirement of a soldier and what their retired life looks like, you do have to look at what they're doing in the military. You know, my dad, again, my dad was a medical administrator, so he went right into healthcare, uh, which was simple. It made sense. It was just the private sector. Um, you know, I, my youngest brother is part of the, you know, first, um, you know, is part of Big Red One at, at Fort Riley, Kansas. He does a lot of field artillery work. When you talk about retirement in field artillery, what is there? You know, there, yeah. there aren't many there aren't many private sectors that just let you roll <laughs> a tank down Main Street. You know, um, my my other brother who's who's infantry, he very well. And again, this is not a knock against him because I'm so proud of what he's done and how he's turned his life around. Um, he doesn't have a college degree. Um, he's an infantry soldier. So what is he qualified to do? Yeah. Maybe security, maybe a police officer that doesn't exactly help in terms of spending more time at home, no, you know? Not at all. Um, so, you know, it, it kind of, that's kind of one of the other things you have to look at. You know, it, it's not, if you're a military spouse and you have no idea what this life is like, or your kids have no idea what this life is like, um, when, when they talk about, you know, mom or dad retiring, it doesn't mean, you know, <laughs> drinks on the beach in, in Miami. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's what did they do in the military and how can they continue to do that? Because they're not going to want to stop working. We live in an age where, you know, nobody wants to talk about taking, you know, just sitting back and cashing your social security check because we're not going to have it pretty soon. But, um, you know, at the same time, it's, it's one of those things where you do at least have the ability where, you know, like for instance, uh, you know, you and your husband, I'm sure you guys will really enjoy the ability to sit there and say, Hey, let's go take a cruise. Well, I can't because we might be up for deployment again, you know, that kind of thing. Like, let's not, you know, you, I'm sure you guys will really enjoy the fact when he does retire that you can say, we don't have a, a potential deployment to worry about. We can book the trip and not have to worry about wasting all of our money on that stuff. So, yeah, and to be able to do those kind of things. So that's, I mean, that's where the retirement really does change is, is you have more freedom to, to plan ahead for the fun stuff, as opposed to just hoping and praying, you know, like for instance, my, my youngest brother, again, he, he might be up for deployment. And it's like, well, you know, there's a big family reunion coming up in September and he's probably not going to be able to make it because he'll probably be overseas. Yeah. So it's just one of those things that you, you can't plan ahead for the fun stuff right now when you're active duty like you can when you're retired. Yeah, and you make a really funny point about your brother having to postpone his wedding because – um, my husband and I didn't have to postpone our wedding, but we got married. And then like, I think a week later he checked into recruiting duty. So we've been married almost 10 <laughs> years and we still have yet to take a honeymoon. So I told him whenever you retire, the first thing that we're going to do is finally take a honeymoon. Yeah. And, and, and actually that's what my, my younger brother and his wife did their honeymoon. It, they, they never actually really truly took a honeymoon when they got PCS from Fort bliss up to Alaska they had a month to report and they took their month, they drove and they went to like Montana and Utah. Like they went to these places that you normally would probably go to if you're just going on a camping trip randomly. And they decided, <laughs> you know what, listen, because the army is sending us all the way up here, let's make some travel time out of it and get the experience. They went to the Grand Canyon. They got to see some of these things that are bucket list items. Um, so I don't think they've taken an official honeymoon, but they found a way to do it. So yeah. they found a way to, to at least enjoy what the army has given them. Yeah, and I feel like a lot of the military is that adapting and overcoming. It's so cliche, yep. but it, but it's true. You have to make the best of it because if not, it'll drive you crazy. Yeah, I mean, in in sports, we use it all the time. The term "survive and advance." I mean, that's basically that's basically what what living in the military is like. Is it's you know you get through this deployment, you get through this duty station, yep. you make the best of it, and then you know the 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 pot of gold at the end of the rainbow is is you know 
when, when those papers finally drop and you have that retirement ceremony and you get to say, Hey, what do we want to do? Cause we have the time to do it now. Yeah. Not only the time, but we have the freedom. We don't have somebody yes. else dictating our lives. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, it's crazy, exactly. but it's, it's so true. Like our, the last almost 10 years that we've been married, we've never gotten to necessarily choose where we want to live. It's mm-hmm. always been told. And so we talk about that all the time. Like, okay, well, when we retire, where are we going to settle down? Because it'll actually be our choice. Exactly. Yep. And that's a big thing. You know, you get, you get to decide where are we going for the holidays? You know, yeah. we get to decide, do we want to stay here and have people come visit us because, you know, we have to stay here or do we want to go, you know, do we want to go visit, you know, my parents, your parents, do we want to go and maybe go and do a destination holiday, those type of things. So you, you're right. The freedom is, is completely there. Um, you know, once, once you, you become a, a retired soldier. Yeah. Yeah. So many great things. And I am so happy to have had you as a guest. I know that you will be back on my show (laughs) because I have so many other things that I want to talk to you about, but I don't want to keep everybody forever. Um, And I know that you have things that you have to do as well. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for being a guest on my show. I am so happy to have had you. I know that you will be back on because... Like I said, we have so many other things that we can talk about, um, but thank you for being here. Well, thank you for letting me, uh, you know, and thank you for, um, you know, first off, I hope I didn't embarrass my, my military family members because again, <laughs> I'd never, I never, I didn't put it on. I've never put on the uniform. So I, I hope I didn't, you know, talk out of both sides of my face there. Um, but at the same time, you know, Jenna, thank you for what you're doing. And, and uh, I, I do, I love the idea of this podcast because, um, again, the, the forgotten people of there's the active duty soldiers, but you always forget about the families. So, um, I'm really excited that this podcast is here as part of public house media and makes it even more fun for me to be a part of it. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. And thank you all for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day and be sure to subscribe. So you never miss an episode. 